Turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. How many of you know that the whole Bible is really about Jesus Christ? We just need eyes to see. And perhaps you've already seen this, but I pray that you see with fresh light that the encounter that Abraham had with his only son and being called to offer up his only son unto God is really a picture of the gospel. It's really a picture of God giving us his only son, which I think is beautiful. So Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ was born. Yet Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He also says, before Abraham was, I am, which signifies that Jesus is indeed the great I am. The I am is the Yahweh, the God who created the heavens and the earth. And the Son bears the same eternal, the same eternity that the Father does and the Spirit does. And we only worship one God, but we worship one God in three persons. Say it one in essence. One God in essence and yet in three persons. And here we see uh, Abraham, God called him. I don't know if you knew this, but Abraham on the other side of the river with his family, um, they were all idol worshippers, according to the book of Joshua, chapter 24, the final verses. Um, God revealed himself to Abraham. God made himself known to Abraham because God chose Abraham and he chose Abraham to be his instrument through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the Lord preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham before the gospel had truly arrived. The gospel fully arrived in Jesus Christ. But Abraham had the gospel preached to him in advance. By the way, this is before Moses, before the law was given. Abraham is called to be a man of faith. And uh, he was, you know, he believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. He put his trust in God. And um, he wanted a child. It, it, it's amazing that the name Abraham means, I have made you a father of many nations. Yet Abraham and Sarah did not have one single child for the longest time. Of course, to cut a long story short, they tried to help God out. You remember? Just like we do sometimes. And uh, the only thing you're going to get when you try and help God out is an Ishmael. <laughs> Trouble in the house <laughs> when you try to help God out. Because it's a product of the flesh. And Abraham and Sarah, the older they got, the promise wasn't rescinded. The promise wasn't taken away that they would have a son. In fact, God permitted Sarah to reach past the age of childbearing so that it would have to be him supernaturally that enabled Sarah to have a child. And Abraham was 100 years old. Imagine being a father at 100 years old. You might get confused as the grandpa, right, Gordon? Inside joke, I know. Um, Sarah being 90 years old. Now, the good news is no other 90-year-old has ever given birth to a child, so relax. You're okay. But God did this to show that he had a plan and a purpose, and only he could fulfill that plan. And there are times in our life that we reach the point of no return where we realize unless God do it, it's not going to get done. So finally, God does give them a child. He gives them Isaac. And the promise is, in Isaac shall your seed be called. And by that statement, it was really, in Isaac shall Christ be called, be brought forth, Jesus Christ. And so he's happy, he has his son, and 
as far as earthly people, we could, we could safely say that Abraham loved his son more than anyone else on planet earth. And yet God tells Abraham to give this son up. We try to understand here what must have been going on in Abraham's heart. We understand that Abraham was a man of faith. And we understand that Abraham realized that the promises can't be broken. The promises can't be rescinded. The promises can't be taken away. Yet God is testing him and he tells him to offer up his only son. Let's go here to Genesis 22 and verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. You understand that back then, God would appear in supernatural ways to people. They didn't have Bibles like we do. Um, the, the time in the era of the Holy Spirit had not yet arrived. God would appear to these people in visions, in dreams, and, and, and in unique fashion because Abraham had no Bible. God spoke to Abraham and the voice that he had heard so often throughout the years came back to him again and it was unmistakably God who was speaking to him and he says, here I am. Now there are moments in our life that we know plainly when God is speaking to us and I'm not referring to an audible voice here, amen? If you're hearing audible voices all the time, seek prayer, seek help. Just saying, I used to be there too. But there's, there's something real when you know that God has spoken to you. It's real. And uh, scripture says that so then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's unmistakable. When you're trying to convince yourself that God spoke to you because you want something or you want something to happen, then that's presumption. That's not God at all. And we can usually tell when it's not really God because it's not really encouraging us to walk closer to him. It's pulling us away in some way or it's a selfish enterprise. When I meet people that say, God told me, God told me, God told me, God told me, it usually ends up leading them astray. Usually what I've discovered as a pastor is usually when people say, I just feel led by the Spirit. I just feel led by the Spirit. That's a justification to do something that ain't right. Especially when you try to give godly counsel and say, but that's not what the Scripture says. Well, I don't care what the Scripture says in their thinking. They say, I just feel led by the Spirit. No, you're not. You may as well say it. I want to do it. Don't, don't put God on it. That's your excuse, your disobedience, and I know we've all seen that at times and perhaps been guilty of it ourselves. Your heart is deceptive, and, uh, but when God speaks, you know it's God, unquestionably so, because usually he tells you things you really don't want to hear. Like having that friend that you only see at certain times. <laughs> Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. So we're told here why God did this. God was testing Abraham. You say, does God test people? Yeah. Scripture says he does, right? But when God tests people, it's not to tempt them to do wrong. It's to test them to do right and to grow in their faith. You see, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Abraham knew that. Well, God knew it more than Abraham. But the people around him, how do we really know that God believed Abraham? Or that Abraham believed God, excuse me. I'm not only getting my numbers twisted this morning, 76, 67, I'm getting my words. How do we know that Abraham believed God? Because he offered up his only son. He was willing to take his son, to sacrifice his son, with the belief that God would raise him from the dead. 
Because he had the understanding that once God has promised, he will not remove his promise, rescind his promise. This was early days. We must understand this. When we read um, narratives like this, it's very strange to us. Of course, God would never require human sacrifice, although in a sense, there was one human sacrifice that was required, and it was the sacrifice of his own son. We've read the whole narrative and we understand that God was never going to literally tell Abraham to literally kill his son. But when Abraham has the knife out and he's getting ready to plunge it into the son, he, he has the belief that God's going to have to raise him back from the dead in order to fulfill the promises that he's given to him. And let me remind you that not only was Abraham going to kill his son, he was going to offer him as a burnt offering. Can God raise a burnt offering back from the dead? Amen. By the way, burnt offering in the Hebrew means the offering of ascent. Or the offering of ascension. Think about that, the smell, fragrance. But God didn't require that. But in this we have a picture of God the Father giving us God the Son. We see this. Now, so when he says God tested Abraham, let's look at the word test. I don't do word studies very often from the pulpit, but I think there's a need for it sometimes. Nasa is a verb, it's an action. So behind this action is God himself. It's a verb meaning to test, to try, to prove. Um, it's a, it, it appears nearly 40 times in the Old Testament. This term often refers to God testing the faith, and faithfulness of human beings, including Abraham, the nation of Israel, um, Hezekiah, and David. So Abraham wasn't the only person that God tested. The reason why God tests is for our benefit. It's for our spiritual nurture, our spiritual growth. In other words, it's all right for us to say we believe in God, but how do we really know we believe in God? unless that faith is truly put to the test. How do people around us, how can we have a testimony that we believe in God, unless our faith is tested and tried? Some of the worst moments in your life have turned out to be your greatest testimony and have turned out to be the moments that God has used to touch other people around you. You wouldn't wish to go through that trial. You wouldn't wish to go through that brain tumor. You wouldn't wish to go through those issues, but look how God used it for good. Amen? He brought you out. We don't like it when our faith is tested. We don't like it when our faith is tried. Now, James covers this. If you turn with me to James 2.21, James is looking at the equation of what happened to Abraham. And... Uh, it would appear by all appearances that James seems to contradict Paul, but not in reality. He's looking at it from a different aspect. He's looking at faith in practice. He's saying that faith that's not a live faith is a dead faith. Faith without works is dead. How do we know that someone has faith? They have obedience accompanying the faith they have. Their life is changed. Their life is transformed. And James 2.21, it says, was not, it, was not Abraham our father uh, justified by works? Oh, it gets confusing sometimes, doesn't it? If we could paraphrase here, I believe what James is getting at here is, was not Abraham our father shown to be righteous by works? We know that Abraham believed in God by his action, by his works. That was for his benefit. That was for our benefit, not God's. Faith always begins very personal. It always begins very personal between you and God, but it doesn't stay there. Amen? It will eventually impact your life, and it will impact the lives of others around you. 
That's the reality of it. But it always begins on a personal level. But you can't keep it to yourself. <laughs> Was not Abraham our father justified by works or shown to be righteous by works? When he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Notice this. Verse 22. My finger's going slow here. There we go. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected or completed. In other words, when Abraham listened to God, when Abraham believed God and obeyed God, it perfected and matured the faith that he already had. It brought it out. You see, if you're like me, I'd rather just believe God on a personal level. I don't want my faith to be tested. Do you? It's like, Lord, just take my word for it. I believe in you. <laughs> okay, you believe in me? Let me put it to the test. Oh, no. No, please. No test. We don't want tests. But when God tests you, it's to make you grow. I've heard the analogy of the diaper. Sorry, bad analogy, but although in reality it's good, we've all had the child that, that comes a point, you have to potty train that child, don't you? How many of you enjoy that time? It ain't fun. But if you don't potty train that child, that child will go to kindergarten, to main school, and still be wearing a diaper. How many of you know there are some children that do that? It's an unpleasant time in the household when you have to potty train a little child. But that's a sign that growth is taking place. You try to offer goodies to encourage it to happen. <laughs> well, in a sense, in a spiritual sense, the Lord also, if you pardon the analogy, potty trains you and me. <laughs> There's a time that the diaper must be taken off and there's a time that we must learn to do things correctly. The person that's been a Christian all their life and has never learned obedience, it just becomes rebellion. And we don't grow. This is why God tests our faith to make us grow. Abraham is a positive example of his faith being tested. A negative example is the children of Israel in the wilderness. God tested the children of Israel. What came out? Unbelief. Moaning and groaning. Evil speaking. Why did that come out? Because God wanted to purify it. He wanted them to learn obedience. They could not enter in because of their unbelief. So when God tests people, it's basically to bring out what he knows is already there. He knew that Abraham believed in him, but it wasn't until Abraham acted on that belief and faith that Abraham really grew. So God was growing Abraham. God was maturing Abraham in the same way that he grows you and me. Spiritual growth can be sometimes very difficult. I used to think that the more goosebumps I got, the more I grew spiritually. That's not the case. I grow in my walk with God when I learn to obey. And sometimes my obedience involves suffering. Sometimes it involves, well, I say sometimes, dying to self. <laughs> Doing things I really don't want to do. Our selfishness is the biggest thing that hinders our spiritual growth. I am selfish by nature. Self-centered person. And so are you, I believe. Some worse than others. God wants to hit that area of our life. And he wants us to... Well, Jesus said, if anyone come after me, he must... Deny himself, right? And take up his cross and follow me. Not a popular message. 
That's not going to cause people to run and listen to that unless God's already addressing your heart on that issue. It takes God to embrace a message like that. No human being is going to hear a message about dying to self and say, yippee, I want to die to self. But Jesus said if we die to self, we really live. And that's the key. The most difficult thing in the Christian life is dying to self. You say, well, I didn't put in for that. Well, if you, if you gave your life over to Jesus, you did put in for this. <laughs> this is for all of us. So, as a result of the works, his actions, his faith was perfected, completed. Abraham came down from that mountain with a much stronger faith than when he went up it. Some of us who have been tested came back with a much stronger faith than when we were first put in it, right? God's in control. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. God could trust him. God could speak to him. God could communicate with him. You see that a man is justified. Now here's the scripture that really throws people off. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Is James contradicting Paul here? No. What he's saying is, is he's shown to be righteous. He's shown to be justified to himself and to the eyes of the world. The, the evidence is, is there to inspect what, when um, James is using the term faith alone, he's not using it the same way that uh, Paul is talking about faith. Um, James is talking about faith without life to it, without fruit to it, just a mental assent. Uh, let me give you an example. James says in this same passage, you believe in one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble, right? The demons believe in one God, but do they believe? Is that faith a saving faith? Is it a lively faith? No. And there are many people who say, I believe in God, but it's not the kind of faith that transforms and changes. Martin Luther said this, and I love this quote, and this is something we need to remember. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Amen? We are saved, I'll quote it again then, Michelle, if you like it. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Amen? Now let's go back to Genesis 22 and verse 2. Because our goal is to see Jesus in the text, but we also need to understand some of the workings of what faith really is and of our salvation and this morning, if you're being stretched, you're being tested, you're being tried, and, and you're in a very uncomfortable place this morning, you may rest assured it's the Lord that put you there. You say, what? The Lord put me here? Yes. To try you, to test you, to develop you, to cause you to grow. He said, so, so the Lord's still speaking now to Abraham. God said, take now your son. Your only son, whom you love. Oh, that stung, that stings, doesn't it? Imagine how much did Abraham love Isaac. God knew how much Abraham loved his son Isaac. And he says, your only son whom you love. Isaac can go to the land of Moriah. This is God's idea to do this, not Abraham's. Abraham obeys and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Mount Moriah, by the way, is the same region where Christ was crucified. It's the same mountain location, the same proximity, the same vicinity. It was the place that God chose for Abraham to offer up his own son Isaac. In fact, Jewish tradition would say it's the same spot where David bought the threshing floor. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's Jewish tradition. Same, same spot. 
So here we have Isaac about ready to offer up his only son. And this is a picture of a future time when God the Father would give us his only son. You see what's being played out here? You see that God not only speaks to us in words, he speaks to us in pictures in Scripture. He wants to show us. You know, a lot of people say, I don't read, I'm a picture guy. Well, here's a picture right here. Amen. Here's a drama being played out by God. God is the author of it. Abraham is the main, the main actor with, um, with Isaac as his co-star. Amen. <laughs> oh, Lord. Analogies help. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So God is saying, I will even choose the location. I'm even going to choose the proximity, offer him there. Now we read this, and it's a strange account to us, of course. But as Abraham hears this, his faith is intact. He's getting ready to offer up his only son. But he has the understanding that God's promises will indeed still come to pass, and God will give his son back to him somehow, because in Isaac shall your seed be called. Now, also, Abraham had a vital understanding of something that we don't understand very often. He understood stewardship. Now, let me emphasize what stewardship is. Everything that we have has been given to us from God. Do we believe that? Our sons and daughters, our grandchildren, our possessions, it's all been given to us from God. If God calls you to give something up for him, it's his anyway. Isaac was God's. Your son, your daughter, is God's. And one of the difficult things at times is to release our sons and daughters to God. And the problem with that is we don't understand stewardship that they weren't ours in the first place. They belong to him. And so when God begins to put his finger on our heart and life and say, give that son to me, give that daughter to me, we need to let go. And we need to release them to God. Because God's getting ready to work in that person's life. But you're getting in the way because you're holding on. You're not laying that son on the altar. You're not giving that son and daughter back to God. You're holding back. And God's saying, trust me. Trust me. And um, usually what God does when he tests us, he will put his finger on the most sensitive area of our life. You see, if we love anyone more than God, do you know what that really is? idolatry. Do you know who we really love more than God? Ourself. All idolatry, even our love for others more than God, is based on self-idolatry. And God has said this to us this morning, you will have no other gods before me. In fact, our relationships get really hurt when we are loving that person more than God. We are carrying things we are not meant to carry. We are stewards. And when God calls to give something back that he himself gave you, how wrong it is to not release it to him or that person to him. This is something that Job understood. How many of you read the book of Job lately? Terry's favorite book. Job said this, Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job understood this. When we look at this from a stewardship standpoint, God blessed Job with children, houses, lands, cattle, you name it. The richest man on planet Earth, more likely. The most righteous man, for sure, in God's estimation. But when all this devastation happened, the thing that saw him through was 
I'm just a steward. What do I have that God didn't first give to me anyway, right? Now, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Have you ever seen a child born with clothes on? Even the clothes we wear were given to us. Naked I came from my mother's womb. You've heard, you've heard it before, you will never see a U-Haul attached to a hearse, right? We brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can take nothing out. I think the reason why we hold on to these things is because we're insecure. We're trying to find security in the wrong things. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Now here's the stinger. And this is something we must accept, just like Job at times. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. No, this is next line. Blessed. Be the name of the Lord. Can we say that in our losses? As well as our gains? We can only say that if we trust the sovereign God, that he's sovereign all, over all our life, that what we lose, he has a purpose in that, even in our losses. But instead we get bitter. We get angry against God. We lash out against God. Because, you know, he took away from us that which was ours. No, it was his. The child that he seemed to have taken too soon, that child is now with God in glory. You'll see that child again. I don't understand everything, but we know this. That what God takes, he takes home with him. And you'll see again. He has a purpose. He sees all things and whatever he does is for our good ultimately, though it doesn't feel good right now. It's hard to trust when we don't understand. But even our understanding can become an idol. Do we realize that? When we say, I'm not going to trust unless I understand, aren't we worshiping our own understanding? Aren't we putting conditions on God? that scripture doesn't permit us to. We are called to trust him whether we understand or not. And Abraham, you know, didn't fully understand what was taking place here, but he did afterwards. Now, let's go back here, Genesis 22, 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. I think I would have slept in on this one. <laughs> But Abraham rose early in the morning. I probably would have stayed up all night and stayed in bed till one o'clock or something. Worried about it. But not Abraham. Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. Got in his minivan. No. <laughs> and took two of his young men with him. As, as witnesses, essentially. He didn't need those two young men. But he took them with him. And Isaac, his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Obedience. Now here's a point. On the third day, this is important. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. So on the third day, Abraham, Isaac, the two young men got there. And guess what? On the third day, he receives his only son back from the dead in a figure. Amen? You see the gospel in this? Notice this. And notice that Abraham did go into this with the full awareness that God, God would have to raise up Isaac from the dead. It said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac... And he who had received the promises, plural, was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed or descendants shall be called. Guess what? No Isaac, no seed. No Isaac, no promises. No Isaac, no father of many nations. All the promises given to Abraham 
were in Isaac. And so as he's getting ready to offer up Isaac, if Isaac stayed dead, the promises died with him. Oh, but when Isaac was raised back up, guess what? The promises remained intact. But something had to have happened in Abraham's heart. A release, a firmer faith, a firmer reality of what he believed in as, he ha as he's about ready to offer up his son. Imagine for a moment the change and the growth of faith that must have flowed through him as he as he's about ready to obey to the point of giving his son to God and plunging the knife in. And of course, God didn't permit it, thank God. He doesn't require human sacrifice like that. But it's all a picture of what he would do in the future. You see, God the Father did not hold back the knife. Do we realize that? God the Father did not hold back. The Son did not hold back in his obedience. When the son in the garden said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me in Gethsemane. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine be done. The father did not lift the knife. He let the knife go right in to his own son. So Hebrews eleven nineteen, Abraham, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. So, resurrection is being preached to Abraham here on Mount Moriah in the very proximity of where Jesus himself would be crucified 2,000 years down the road. Man, God's timing isn't like mine or yours, is it? I want God to do things in two days, not 2,000 years. I'm on a time limit here. I'm... If by strength I get to live to be 76, Terry, or if by strength, 80, 90, you know. But I'm on a time zone. But Scripture says these all died in faith, having not yet received the promises. Do we realize this morning that death doesn't mean the promises didn't happen? Some people die in faith before, before the reality is given. They die with the prospect of still going to happen. Still going to happen. Why? Because I believe in the resurrection. Not only in the resurrection of Jesus, but in the resurrection of every believer. We will live forever in immortality. So he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type, a picture. So get the picture here. Abraham saw my day and was glad. After God said, don't touch him, don't hurt him. Now I know you put you, you know, your whole trust in me. When Isaac got back down from that altar, he sees Jesus in Isaac. Amen. He sees the future seed. He sees what's going to happen in the future. Abraham is having the gospel preached to him in advance. And that's why Jesus said, not only that Abraham saw my day, Abraham rejoiced and saw my day and was glad. Do you think there was rejoicing when Isaac's getting back down from that altar? And he sees the ram in the thicket and he substitutes Isaac with the ram. And there's another picture that Christ would be our substitutionary sacrifice. It should have been me nailed to that cross because of my sin. But he became my substitute. He became your substitute. He died in my place so I might live. He died in your place so I might go free. He took the penalty, the punishment that should have been mine, that should have been yours. And he did it for you and me. So the promises remain intact. We could say this this morning, as all the promises given to Abraham were poured into Isaac, all the promises of God are poured into Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus died and didn't rise again, would all the promises still be able to happen? The resurrection confirms for all the promises of God in him, I yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. What Paul is saying here is, it's not us, it's through us, we're preaching Christ. All the promises in him are yes and amen. Let's go back to Genesis 22 here. 
Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. Reminds me of the parting sermon of an assistant pastor as he's leaving his old church. He says, you abide here with the donkey while I go over yonder to worship. Never mind. Okay. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. He also preached from the King James on that day as well. And I and the lad will go over there. And we will worship and return to you. He has faith, doesn't he? Not only will I return to you, guess what? We're going to worship. We're going to offer ourselves to God. And when God receives us, we're going to come back down from that mountain and return to you. We will return to you. Amen? Here's the picture of Calvary's cross. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. So you've got Isaac carrying the wood on his back. What did Jesus do? He carried the cross on his back in obedience to the Father's bidding. You have the Father and the Son working together here, cooperating the Son, cooperating with the Father in implicit, unquestioning obedience. Isaac, you see, very often we focus just solely on, on Abraham being the Father, giving his only son. But what about Isaac? <laughs> He's the one that has to lay down his life. <laughs> Can't we see a picture here? The son lays down his life in obedience to the father's desire. Picture. Wonderful picture. Abraham being a picture of God the father. Isaac being a picture of the only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. What did Jesus say? I and the Father are one. Right? We're one. We're doing this together. Now notice this. We don't know how old Isaac was because uh, he's called the lad. I'm guessing he might have been teenage, maybe. But I think he had the ability to run from his father if he wished. <laughs> I think he could have outran a hundred plus year old man, don't you? Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, that's beautiful as well. My father. I think of father when Jesus used the term father, if it be possible. My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Something's missing. Abraham had done this before, and Isaac had witnessed it, and there was usually a lamb involved. Guess what? You're the lamb, <laughs> Isaac. No lamb here. You're going to be the lamb. No. Abraham believed God. Abraham knew that God was good, even though seemingly he's asking him to do something that's very hard, very difficult. Abraham trusted God implicitly, without question at this point, in the same way that Isaac implicitly trusted in his father. There comes a point, my friend, when we have to have implicit trust in God. It's a process to get there. Now, by implicit trust, I'm talking about God. I don't understand, but I trust you, right? I believe that though it looks bad, it doesn't look good. I believe you have a plan and a purpose in this, and you're going to bring good out of this somehow. You're in control. That's the kind of faith that God wants out of you and me, that we trust him implicitly. People trust other things without question. They trust things without question. They trust churches without question. Uh, men and women of God without question. That, my friend, is the wrong place to place implicit trust. We put implicit trust in God alone. Because he's the only one that won't fail you. Now, let's go here to verse 8. I'm not going to read the whole thing today, so you will get out of here. Abraham said, 
God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Here we have the beautiful name of God, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord himself will provide. It's a covenant name of God where God covenants himself to humanity. All the names, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sekenyu, um, Jehovah Rapha, uh, Jehovah Jireh, they're all expressions of who God is to us in a covenant sense. Don't we realize our greatest need is God? And God has given himself to us. And God has pledged himself to us in specific ways. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And he did. And he has for you and me. Amen. So the two of them walked on together. Abraham doesn't quite know what's going to transpire here. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. So now Isaac really knows, I'm the sacrifice. Okay, Father, I love you. I don't understand what you're doing. But I trust you. You've never led me wrong, Father. And, and I've learned so much from you, Father. And here I am in implicit trust. Didn't Jesus have implicit trust in the Father? When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he himself did not one sin. He did nothing wrong. He was absolutely perfect. Of course, Jesus understood. He's quoting Psalm 22 verse 1 with that. But I think it shows implicit trust from the Son to the Father that he's obedient even to the point of death. And some of his final words were, Father, into thy hands I commit I entrust my spirit. That's faith. And if anyone had absolutely perfect faith, it was obviously Jesus Christ. Oh, think of the suffering he endured and think of what he went through on that cross. And rather than, rather than failure, we have a perfect faith, a perfect trust in God being expressed. No wonder why the other thief on the cross quit railing on him and said, wait a minute. There's something different about this fellow. We're being judged for stuff we've done, but this man's done nothing wrong. My friend, when you're suffering, it doesn't bring out the best in you. Think about it. I can be nice and courteous, you know. So can you. But if I'm in a lot of pain, guess what? If I've got ugly in me, that ugly's going to come out. Think about it. Jesus had perfection in him. And as he's hanging on that cross, perfection came out. He, though he was a man just as you and me, 100% man, 100% God, he wasn't a man like you and me because he was sinless. He was perfect. He was born of a virgin. And didn't do one thing wrong. If that was you and me on the cross, you may rest assured we would not be quoting scripture. So here's the action. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Here's something that often gets missed. The angel of the Lord speaking here is the Lord. It's Christ himself. And when he intervenes here, he intervenes because he said, I'm going to be the one that's going to die, not Isaac. I'm going to be the one that's going to die in his place. I'm going to be the Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to be the provision. The angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ himself before he came in human flesh. He's preventing this from taking place. He says, I'm going to be the sacrifice. Stop. Amen. Amen. And he said, here I am. And he said, he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God. Obviously God knew that already. But by his action, he's proving 
his fear of God and his faith in God, right? You've heard the old, even the world has a saying, actions speak louder than words, right? Oh, the great claims to faith we make. But if our actions even remotely covered our claims to faith, we would be spiritual giants by now. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham loved God more than his own son. Do you love God more than your own son? Do you love God more than your own wife, your own children, your parents? You see, we are called to love God more than anybody else. You say, does that mean I'm going to neglect them? No, if you truly love God, you will love them more as well. That's the beauty of it. Because you won't be loving them with a selfish love. You'll be loving their soul. You'll be loving them for who they are. You'll be wanting their salvation more than anything else in the whole world. You'll love them with God's love, which is the kind of love God's after. Oh, how selfish our love often is and how we hinder very often even our own children from growing in the faith because we get in the way. Release. Time to release, and it's time to release, release them to the Lord. Now, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Oh, look, God did provide right there on the spot too. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. No, he says, in the place of his son. Here we have substitute being proclaimed. It's not often a ram will get caught by the thickets with his horn, but didn't God cause that to happen? Some of you here are hunters, and I've heard some interesting stories, but usually you have to go look for the animal, don't you? Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. There it is. A revelation of God through this whole event. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Guess what? It has been provided. We're living 2,000 years after the fact. Jesus Christ was provided for you and me. It should have been you and me on that cross, but Jesus took our place. We should have been the one that was slain, and he took our place, and he died in our stead so that we could be free. He took our sin. He took our penalty. He took our judgment that should have been ours, and he died. Can we trust in him this morning? Can we put our faith in him? Now, we are going to break bread this morning. I didn't forget and I think the message we've looked at today is fitting for what we are about to partake of. Um, the Lord said on the night in which he was betrayed, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, showing that it was something that was meant to be repeated, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And so the ordinance entrusted to the church is the break, I, I call it the breaking of bread. I call it the Lord's table. I guess depending on what tradition you're from, you might call it something different. But why we do this, we do this to remind ourselves what Christ has done for us. Because we need reminding, don't we? There's no reason this morning why we should leave if you're feeling this way, still feeling guilty, still feeling wicked, sinful, we can take these things to the cross, repent of them in our hearts, ask God to forgive us, ask God to wash us, and the emblems which are representative of the reality as we partake of the bread and we drink the cup, by faith we are receiving the true cleansing of the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all sin. Before me, help me walk Shadow over me.
our Lord was betrayed he took the bread and he said this is my body which is broken for you take eat And then he took the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's receive. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. There is prayers. If anybody needs prayers, we're here to pray. Also, I know there's some prayer needs out there and different people have other people on their heart to pray for as well. So we're here for that. God bless.